My name is Selina Rose. I was born in 1942 in the Krakow ghetto in Poland. Uh, a horrific place to be born in. The ghetto was a hellish place on earth. The entire Jewish population of Krakow were crammed into a very small area of Krakow. Around about 20,000 people were housed in an area that should have housed perhaps 1,300 people. And the conditions were hellish. Very little sanitation, no medical care, no heating. Frequently, people, several families would share one room. It's estimated about each person had about two meters of personal space. And of course, as well as that, there was always the terror of death as people were regularly shot, tortured, and uh, died of starvation. So that was the, the kind of atmosphere that I was born into. My father, who was a bookkeeper, lived with his mother, elderly mother, and her sister in one part of the ghetto. And my, my mother, who was a milliner, lived with her family in another part of the ghetto. I never met my father. Uh, two days before I was born, my father went out. Everyone was always foraging for food and uh, was just taken up, picked up in the street, put on the back of a truck and never heard from again. And we think he was shot somewhere, but we've never been able to find what happened to him. He was 39 years old at the time. Two days after that, I was born in, in the only hospital there was in, in the ghetto with one medical doctor there by the name of Dr. Blau. Um, I was a very thin, scrawny little baby that, who cried a lot due to malnutrition, both for my mother and for myself. But my grandfather very conscious of being in such a small space and not wanting to annoy the people around him would pick me up and carry me through the night and, and try to pacify me so that we wouldn't uh, disturb too many people. Um, however, the next tragedy that, that um, happened to our family was when all the older men were selected for, for murder to be murdered, and my grandfather was amongst them. I had a young aunt called Frances who was only 18 years old, and at the time where you really didn't make yourself conspicuous in any way, she found where her father had been taken and pleaded with the Nazi in in control of that group to let her father go, but he refused and they gave her a beating for her trouble. But she was very courageous in trying to save her father. When I was nine months old, the ghetto was liquidated. The Nazis felt at that time, although they were torturing and killing the inhabitants of the ghetto, that the um, the program and the timetable of genocide was not moving along fast enough. They weren't able to kill as many people as was required for the Nazi timetable. So they closed the ghetto down. Anybody who couldn't work uh, was shot. Uh, others were sent off to concentration camps, death camps. Uh, people who could work were relocated to a camp just outside of Krakow called um, Pwashuf. Um, children who were non-productive, the parents were instructed to put the children into an old building to be looked after, quote unquote. And so the, the ghetto was emptied and of course, Many of the parents tried to hide their children in, under the floors, in ceilings, in cupboards, but largely those efforts were unsuccessful. My mother 
and her sister, older sister, who had two boys, aged nine and 12, had no intention of placing us together with the other children. And they decided that we would all hide. And if we lived, we lived. And if we died, we would all die together. And their decision was very well formed because the building where the children had been put was subsequently bombed with all the children inside with no survivors. So as the ghetto was emptied, they hid all together. And they went from building to building looking for a safe haven. But of course, it was a, a foolish plan because they were in the ghetto, surrounded by walls, and really there was nowhere for them to go. I had a 22-year-old uncle, Uncle Martin, who was the risk taker of the family. He was given the job of coming from the camp back into the ghetto to pick up the belongings that had been left behind by some of the um, Jewish police and, and other inhabitants. And he was aware that his sisters had not reached Pwashuf, the work camp. So he drove with the horse and cart up and down the streets of the ghetto, calling out their names. And they happened to hear him, and they came running. The two boys were put on the back of the cart amongst all the packages and boxes that he had collected. And he put me in a wicker basket and ran with me as far as he could, fast as he could to the Jewish hospital to see Dr. There, um, the only Jewish doctor who is left, and she gave him some sedation and he sedated me. Now, the doctor at the hospital had the ability to escape. She was married to a Gentile man and could have made her way out of the ghetto and saved her own life, but she refused to do that and she stayed with her patients. So once having sedated me, the, um, he put me back on the cart and he drove with me and the two hidden boys into the camp of Prashuf. He gave the boys into the care of their father, who was there, and he gave me into the care of my grandmother, who was in the women's barracks. But unfortunately, the two boys and their father didn't survive. They were murdered. Now, my, my mother and her sister were now left in the almost deserted ghetto, wondering what to do next. And as luck would have it, they saw a group of women being marshaled together further down the road, and they both had work permits. So they just joined that group, and the usually meticulous Nazi who would have being very, very careful of numbers, was in a hurry, was getting late, so he didn't count how many members of the group there were, and so they were able to, walk, to make their way back to, out of the ghetto into the camp with that group of women. So we have, now we have a baby in the women's barracks, and, of course, any, any infraction of German um, rules was met by death. Every penalty was death. So we have a very, very crowded ba women's barrack with a baby in, inside it. So the women of the barrack were very, very courageous because had I been found, they would all have been shot. And I often wonder when all, of, all that they had was their lives, what made them risk that for some strange baby? But they did, in fact, do that. And my mother placed me, my mother and my grandmother placed me between them in the barracks, and they made a plan that if I cried or if I made a noise and there was any danger of being detected, they would roll over on top of me and suffocate me in that, so that they didn't endanger the lives of all these brave women who had allowed me to be in the barrack. 
makes, gives me great pause. And every time I say that, you know, what a world where you have to plan to do something like that. Now, the commandant of, the, of Pashov was a very sadistic man. His name was Amon Goethe. He delighted in, in killing the prisoners. He used to use them as target practice for his own amusement. And he regularly used to inspect the barracks with his German shepherd dogs to see that everything was in order. And in fact, while I was being hidden in the barracks, he came along one day with his dogs and they sniffed around very close to where I lay and by some miraculous luck, they didn't detect me. And so I was saved at that time. And of course, this was not a place where I could stay for any length of time. So once again, my uncle Martin came to my aid and devised a plan having smuggled me into the camp to smuggle me out of the camp. So he had a little bit of sedation left, so once again I was sedated, and he enlisted the help of his older brother John, who is a very timid man and did not like to take chances, but once again he risked his life for me. So they put me in a sack, and they put the sack between, between them in a very close formation with all the men in the working party. And of course, they had to get the permission of the men in the working party. Had I been detected once again, that would have been the end for all of that group. And once again, bravely and generously, they agreed to try to smuggle me out of the camp. This group worked in a, in a factory just outside of Krakow, which made German uniforms. So this group then marched quite a considerable way back to the, back to the factory. And apparently my uncle told me that during the walk I started to squawk and make a few no noises and there was a Romanian one-armed guard that was walking beside them and either he didn't hear or he chose not to hear and once again my life was, was spared. I sometimes think I'm, I have won the lottery of life, honestly. So many times when things could have gone drastically wrong and they didn't. Now, in the German, in the factory where they made the German uniforms, the prisoners would change from their striped camp guard into white uniforms. And Martin must have bri bribed the guard at the door and left the factory carrying a small baby in a, in a, in a sack. Of course, there was no plan. He could only take his chances, and he ran around through the streets of, of Krakow, knowing that he had a very limited time, knowing that if he was detected, that would be his death knell as well, looking for someone who might look after a baby. He met a woman he had known before the war who told him that there was a woman who ran a dance hall just nearby. And of course, there were a lot of women coming and going from this dance hall and they had children and the woman felt that perhaps that might be his chance of finding a safe haven for me. So in fact, this Polish lady did agree to take me and my uncle bribed her and luckily was able to find a spot for me and go back to his factory. Now, this Polish lady um, often came past the factory where my uncles lived looking for, uh, worked, sorry, worked, looking for further bribes. 
Unfortunately, the work camp of Pashuf then became a closed concentration camp and my uncles were no longer able to go out to work. Nobody left the camp and no more bribes were forthcoming. And this particular lady, Polish lady, had a German boyfriend and he was starting to ask questions. Who is this child? Where did she come from? And she began to feel very, very uncomfortable. So she put a sign around my neck, a piece of cardboard around my neck, saying Marisha, which is a very common Polish name, with my birth date on it. And she left me sitting on a street corner. But she thought, just in case someone comes back after the war, she decided just to hang back and, and see what actually happened. Once again, my luck prevailed, and out of a building just opposite the corner, there lived a Polish couple, a childless Polish couple by the name of Karol and Maria Zmuda. And they came out of their building, and they saw a baby on the, on the street, and they picked me up and they took me in, which was very brave of them because anyone who suspected of, of harboring a Jewish child could expect to be shot, and this was a very brave decision on their part. So once again, I was extremely fortunate. So now I was a little Catholic girl living in a Catholic household and I, believe, I was told that I really enjoyed very much going to church. I enjoyed the music and I enjoyed the bright colours and I do have some vague memories from that time. And also apparently in Poland the custom was that if you saw a nun, one you would go, children would go and kiss their hand and kneel in front of them as a mark of respect. And of course, we did all that in the Zmuda household. Suddenly, of course, the neighbors noticed that suddenly there was a child where there hadn't been a child previously. And the Gestapo came knocking on the Zmuda's door, wanting an explanation for where did this child come from? And Mr. Jmuda made up a story that he had had a mistress in the countryside and that she had died and that I was his child and he had picked me up from the countryside and brought me to live in the city. And being a blonde, blue-eyed girl, of course, nobody could prove anything other than that. And so I was able to live with the Jmudas until the end of the war. And they shared everything with me, what little food they had, they shared. Unfortunately, because of the privations of that time, I developed TB, but they did the very best for me that they could. So, in the meantime, what had happened to my family? So we come to the enigmatic Oscar Schindler. My a very unlikely saviour of 1,300 Jewish people, and amongst them were seven members of my family. I say he was an unli unlikely saviour because at the beginning he was a German national. At the beginning of the war, he had also been a member of the Nazi party. He, was, um, he had a great network amongst the German hierarchy at that time. And he had owned a factory in Krakow which made enamelware where as he, some of his workers were. And he decided he was a womanizer, he was a hard drinker, he was the most unlikely saviour one could come across, but it's an amazing thing that even in those dreadful times, such unlikely people stepped up, stood up, and were prepared to save people's lives. So luckily for my family, they were placed on Schindler's list. 
And for people who are interested, you can read Thomas Keneally's book and also see the Steven Spielberg movie covering all of those events. And Oscar Schindler risked his own life. He used his own finances. He, he used his network and he protected those people. And due to that, they survived the war. People sometimes are su suspicious of his motives. But my family, first of all, the women in my family, the first remark they made about him was, oh, he was so handsome. <laughs> the men of my family had great respect for him. They absolutely felt that he didn't have any ulterior uh, motives, that he really had been a, a saviour to them, and they were very, very grateful for the fact. So, after, at the end of the war, I was three years old, living as a Catholic girl with, with my adoptive parents, one could say, and my uncle and my mother came back to Krakow and they found the woman who had been looking after me and they asked where, where was the child. So she was able to take them to the home, to the house where she saw the Jmudas lived. And my mother found me there. Mr. Jmuda had been a, a communist and he had been in a concentration camp himself and he was very sympathetic to my mother and she gave them some money that the Red Cross had given to all the concentration camp survivors and they came to the understanding that they would allow me to go with my mother. So at the age of three, I was no longer, my parents weren't my parents. I wasn't Catholic, I was Jewish. I had a highly traumatized mother, um, a totally new family, and a whole new identity. And really, I'm, I can say that really that was the end of my childhood in many ways. Um, concentration camp survivors come in two categories. Those who talk about their exper experiences extensively and those who never talk about their experience in the camps. My mother did uh, talk about her experiences and told me graphic details. So at a very young stage, age, I was very aware of what had happened and, and all the many of the bad experiences that she had been through. And so in a way, um, I learned to mother my mother, which is a very difficult and impossible task that many children of Holocaust survivors did take upon themselves. So things in Poland were very, very bad after the war. And um, and so my family decided that they would leave Poland and, of course, the Iron Curtain was coming down, the Soviets were taking power in, in Poland and they wanted to get as far away from Europe as they possibly could. So we left Poland when I was seven as stateless refugees. My mother, my grandmother and I went to Paris and the rest of the family were in uh, refugee centre there, and the rest of the family went to Vienna. However, my family were due to go to Israel, which was the only reason they were allowed out of Poland. But having just gone through the experience that they did, they really didn't want to go to another war-torn country. So they all tried to go come to Australia. I learned French very quickly. I had a talent for languages. And at seven, I was the interpreter for the family. And when my mother and grandmother went through the process of trying to get permission to come to Australia, I was the interpreter. I would speak, I would speak Polish to them and French to the officials. 
And although our life in Paris was very, very deprived, um, we decided we, we had to make a try to come to Australia. There was a difficulty because I had had TB as an infant, so there was a possibility that I wouldn't be accepted. But ultimately, we were. And in 1951, we came to Australia and I was, when I was nine years old. Australia was a great haven for my family. They, they established themselves, they worked very, very hard, and they really enjoyed all the opportunities that are available here. I eventually became a teacher, which was my profession and my passion, and I met my husband, Lynn, and we married almost 55 years ago, had two children. We now have three exceptional grandchildren, and really, our lives have been very, very happy ones. And only made possible by the generosity and the bravery of all the upstanders who risk their own lives just for a strange child. <laughs>